All right, as we wrap this thing up on uh, raising amazing kids, pull out your notes. We're going to fly today. I'm going to begin by reading a, a very key verse on parenting. And what this verse does, this kind of gives us the God's eye view of the whole role of parents and, and how this is supposed to work and how it moves from generation to generation. So this is, a, again, this is the God's eye view. This is the view from up above all the cloudiness that we have with our insecurities and fears and all that kind of stuff. Psalm 78. Oh, my people, listen to my instructions. Open your ears to what I'm saying, for I will speak to you in a parable. I will teach you hidden lessons from where? Our past. Circle those. because we're gonna, this, is, this is really a key point here today. The past. Stories we've heard and known. Stories our ancestors handed down to us. We will not hide these truths from our children. Interesting. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord and, and about his power and his mighty works. For he issued his laws to Jacob. He gave his instructions to Israel. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children so the the next generation might know them. Now underline the part between the dashes. Even the children not yet born, and they in turn will teach their own children. So each generation should set its hope anew on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands. Now watch this. Then they will not be like their grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> and all those dysfunctional rejects in the family tree who refuse to give their hearts to God. This is so important for us because our kids look at their family history and they look at their family tree and they use that to kind of decide who they are and how they're supposed to fit in in the world. If you come from a family of losers, what do your kids do? Oh, yeah, oh, I had this great grandfather. He got hanged for stealing a horse. This other one got killed in a poker match. And this other one was an alcoholic and died, the, and died in the gutter. And so these kids suddenly have this view of themselves. They come from a group of people who are underachievers, unless they stole like a lot of horses, you know? You know, then they're barons. Um, but uh, they come with this view of themselves based on their family tree. And they understand that role, they understand their history just like it's their story. See, we see our kids as a new point in our family, but our kids see themselves as a continuation of the family that's always been. And we've got to take that into consideration. Uh, we got a new puppy at our house named Reggie. Reggie is interesting. I can't explain the name. It's a girl dog, too. Um, I did not name the animal. But uh, so we get this dog named Reggie. The mom was half German Shepherd and half Collie, and the dad was a black lab. So I don't know what Reggie is. I mean, it's one of the funniest looking dogs I've ever seen. It's, it, it looks like a German Shepherd lowrider, you know? I mean, the, 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 it's got lab legs, but they're only like this long. So it's kind of weird looking. I, I swear there's got to be a corgi in there somewhere. But uh, so when Chloe introduces people to our dog, she has to go back and tell the whole history of our dogs in our family. And she always starts with Blondie. Blondie was our first dog. It was a golden retriever. And she uses the exact words. Blondie was such a light golden retriever. She was almost white. Super smart dog, uh, could, could uh, respond to 50, 51 or 52 different objects. You could be sitting in the house with this dog and name one of 52 different items, and this dog would go through the house, find it, and bring it back. I mean, super, super smart dog. Uh, dog could climb ladders, could swim like crazy, you know. And, and so Chloe tells a story about how great this dog was and how much we loved her and how much we miss her. Chloe was born in November of 2000. Blondie died in March of 1994. <laughs> but she's heard us talk about the dog, and she automatically makes the dog a part of her family, too. It was really funny. This, this winter, I heard her talking to one of her friends at school out in the parking lot about, about the church. And so she's talking about the church and how much she loves adventure and all that. And she turns to me, it kind of stuns me because I'm listening and just curious, kind of on her take of, of things and her interpretation of things. And she turns and she looks at me in the middle of the sentence, catches me unaware. And she says, Dad, what year did we move to Davenport to start Adventure? <laughs> Let me say it again. Chloe was born in November of 2007. Or excuse me, 2000. Wow, that makes her really smart. Uh, 2000. <laughs> we moved here Labor Day weekend of 1997. 
See, the thing about our kids, we've got to understand, is that our kids see themselves as a continuation of the family, not a new beginning. Now, let me look at one more verse with you, okay? So we've got God's eye perspective of how it's supposed to happen to the process. Now, let's get kind of the God's eye view of the goal at the end, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Now, let me just add as we go into this, a lot of you who get frustrated with your kids are targeting the wrong thing in your kids. You get frustrated with their behavior and you're trying to treat their behavior and you need to treat the cause of the behavior. This goal treats the cause of the behavior. Deuteronomy 6. Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God and the Lord alone, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, Jesus would later add all your mind right there, and all your strength. So what he tells us is this. This is the treasure that really matters in your family life and in your kids. Not their grade point average, not their, their position in their graduating class, not whether they get scholarships, not whether they go to an Ivy League school, not whether they're able to get a great job with big benefits and a big package, not whether they're ever able to own their own business or have a massive house or whatever, not that they have big families, not even that they retire well. What matters is that we train our kids for the pursuit of loving God with all their heart, all their soul, all their mind, and all their strength. And if we can do that, it fixes every other thing in their life. See, when I love God with all that's within me, all my heart, all my, all, all my, heart, all my soul, all my mind, all my strength, that is a heart that is yielded to God. That's a heart that's obedient and faithful to God. And we, we look at that and we think, man, you know what, if I could get my kid to do that, I'd have the perfect kid. No, you would not. It's not about perfection. It's about the pursuit of, of God. The treasure that really matters is that we love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our might, all of our strength. We'll probably not ever accomplish that in this life, but it's the pursuit of it. Listen, I, I know some of you, some of you've had rough lives. As my, my horse owning friends in Oklahoma and Texas say, some of you have been road hard and put away wet. You've been mistreated and not been maintained well. And somehow, You've come to church, and you're around all these other people, and now you're worried about other people knowing your past life, and your mistakes, and your foolishnesses. And so now what you've started to do is you have started playing the church game where you start to tell yourself everybody else in this room has it together. And you think because everybody else in here has it together, you have to put on a mask and wear a mask so they can't see who you are, and except for a, you know, an occasional ambiguous veiled reference to something dumb in your past, you start playing the game just as if you've had it all together all along and you still have it all together now. Does anyone else want to laugh at that with me? <laughs> Listen, if that's you, please don't do that. You make me nervous, okay? I don't like being around perfect people. Um... When you behave like that, when you fake having it all together, that devalues that treasure that God has placed inside of you. And quite honestly, like I said, it scares a lot of us. We're not sure what to do already. And it pressures us to try to play that we got it all together game too. And I don't want us to ever do this. This is a church of imperfect people. I've often joked that our motto outside on the sign should be, perfect people need not apply. Don't do that kind of stuff. Listen, this is a church of imperfect people who are redeemed, who are being redeemed. In fact, a lot of us have lived like a lot of the characters in the Bible. Yeah, we're getting it together near the end. Well, let's face it, man, we screwed up the beginning. <laughs> Big time. Big time. In fact, some of our stories aren't a lot different from some of the ones that are in the Bible. Now, watch what the Apostle Paul says in this next passage about some of these characters we think so highly of in Scripture. I don't want you to forget, dear brothers and sisters, about our ancestors in the wilderness long ago. These things happened to them. Why? As examples for us. They were written down to warn us who were living at the end of the age. Listen, we learn from the past. And you may say, but you don't have any idea how dumb I was in the past. You know, I think when we read some of the stories of the Bible, we get this inflated, unrealistic view of just how saintly some of these people we or some of these people work. Greg was contagious. I can't even talk now. Um, I should have never let him touch the chair. Um, we get some of these unrealistic expectations 
of how some of these people fought and how some of they, how some of the, Greg, how some of them behave. And they were just like you and me, and they're just trying to honor God in their lives and in spite of their mistakes. You know, I think if King David were to publish the book of Psalms today, he would probably subtitle it, 150 chapters of stupid things I did that prove how good God really is. You know, have you ever had a stupid attack? You know what a stupid attack is? It's when your brain knows not to go there and your body just keeps flying, you know? Your mouth won't stop inside, you're screaming, help! And your mouth is going, look how stupid I am, you know, that kind of a thing. You have that thing developing. Uh, check this one out. Okay, this one, I'm going to read to you here a second. This is by Aaron, the brother of Moses. Let me give you a little background. Moses was supposed to lead two million Jews out into the desert, but Moses had, Moses had a speech impediment. We don't know what it was if he stuttered. We don't know if he lisped. But he was afraid to even talk about people or he talked to people. And so before he would go, he said to God, how about my brother, El- my brother Aaron? He's eloquent. Okay, he clearly was not around Greg today. Um, he's eloquent. Let's let him do all the talking. And so God brings Aaron on. So Aaron is like Moses' uh, press secretary, <laughs> communications director. So he gives the public service announcements and all that stuff. So they use him because he's so eloquent. Now, Moses has gone up onto the mountain to get the Ten Commandments from God, and he's been gone for a long time. And people on the ground now, down in the, the wilderness, are getting worried about where is he? He's been gone for a month. What are we supposed to do? Maybe a bear ate him or something. We don't know. And so they're worried about where he is, but they're not worried about the sense of we should go get him. They're worried in the sense like, who's in charge? <laughs> where do we go from here? What happens next? How's the chain of command work? And so they assume it's Aaron. Well, Aaron's not a leader. He's a press secretary, right? He's not a leader. So Moses comes back and he sees the people dancing around this big golden calf. And they're worshiping this big golden calf that they've made. And uh, Moses is so mad, he takes the Ten Commandments that God just gave him and threw them on the ground and broke them. Like broke all Ten Commandments at once. (laughs) So he smashed the the tab. Just boom, right there. Okay, now... (laughs) He comes down on the ground, and if you watch Aaron's response, Moses is so ticked off, Aaron is scared to death of him. All right, here we go, verses 22 through 24. Don't get so upset, my Lord. Now, this is a brother addressing a brother. It's like saying, sir, okay? Don't be so upset, sir. So he knows his brother's about about to kill him. You know yourself how evil these people are. They said to me, make us gods who will lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here from the land of Egypt. So he's blaming Moses. So I told them, whoever has golden jewelry, take it off. And when they brought it to me, I simply threw it into the fire and out popped this golden calf. I don't know what happened, Mo. I just threw it in the fire and it popped out all carved and ornate, solid gold. You know how the thing happens. You know, man, it was so weird, man. You know? That's the modern equivalent of saying, yes, Ossifer, I only had two beers, okay? (laughs) Now, that's why the Apostle Paul says to us back in 1 Corinthians 10, all this stuff is recorded for us so that we can learn from their stupid mistakes and not fall into their traps. But so we can also learn from their mistakes and teach them to our kids so that our kids don't fall into those traps. You see, this spiritual journey that we're on as a family... It really is a journey. And there's a lot of wrong turns we can take at many given points. I mean, there's just a lot of them. We can waste a lot of time and we can waste a lot of life with these wrong turns and these mistakes. But if we focus on it from God's perspective, we can save a lot of time and save a lot of pain if we teach our kids the direction they should be pursuing. Now, many of them won't pursue it perfectly, any more perfectly than we did. But they still have the information to make the choices with. You know, Jesus said it like this. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and God will do what? He'll give you everything you need. If you're worried about what your kids are going to do in life and how they're going to survive, here it is. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and God will give you everything you need. So he will equip our kids if we train our kids. Now, three things I think we need to... We, three. Excuse me. Three questions we need to ask. Three things we need to deal with as Christ-following parents. We're going to raise these amazing kids and help them find this treasure. All right. Question number one: Where are we now? Where are we now? A couple of friends and I teach a, a disaster survival camp for sixth through ninth graders every summer in June, 
And we put them in a scenario where they're starting after natural disaster. This last year we used, we were just, what, a week after, a week and a half after the Joplin tornado. And so we used the Joplin tornado as their their disaster. And we put them in a primitive camping section uh, of this big camp, several hundreds of acres. We put them in this primitive uh, area. And they've got no electricity, no water, no shelter. And what we do is we spend a week teaching them how to survive in that situation. We, we teach them how to build shelter out of what's there. We teach them how to, how to create fires. We, we teach them how to get water out of the trees and how to filter water. Um, we teach them how to cook food over their own fires that they've made without matches and all this kind of stuff. So we teach them all that. But we also teach them how, how to use a compass and a map because they've got to learn how to orient themselves. And so we give them all this stuff, and inevitably, when we give them the map and the compass, the very first thing they try to do is play with the compass, right? Does it really point north? So we give them 10 minutes to mess around with the compass because they're not listening anyhow. Okay, then once we get past that, we want them to find themselves on the map, and we cut them loose to go find their destination, which is usually usually only a few hundred feet, maybe a couple hundred yards away, but it's through the woods. And uh, inevitably, the first thing they try to find on the map is they're looking for the destination. That's what they're looking for. They're looking for the destination. And that's good. They need to identify that on the map, and we want them to do that. But before the map can have any value to them, what else have they got to figure out? Where they are. I mean, you know, if you're in New York and you've got a map of Illinois, good luck. It's not going to help you. You know, so you've got to figure out where you are to start with. You know, if you don't know where you are, you can't really locate your destination. So how do you figure out where we are on this journey. All right, first thing A, learn from my past, but don't get hung up on it. All right, you need to learn from your past, but don't get hung up on it. Some of you have had some rough past. I mean, you made some mistakes. Maybe you've lost some marriages. You've lost some kids. You've lost some family. You've destroyed your reputation. Maybe you've been in jail. Maybe you've been in prison. Maybe you've been in rehab. Maybe you've been in bankruptcy. I don't know. That's all good to know. That helps you locate where you are now. But don't dwell on that stuff. That's all educational stuff. You know, I've sat with parents who, who tell me things like, you know, I can't tell my kids not to smoke pot, and I can't tell my kids not to drink, because I was doing it at their age. I was doing it at their age. And they'll just say, I'm a hypocrite because I did it. Or I can't tell my kids to, to protect their virginity until marriage because I didn't do that. That's how I got that kid. <laughs> you know? That'd be hypocritical for me to tell them not to do that after I did it. Listen. When kids get mad, they call names and say stupid things, right? That's why we don't let them run for president at 15, okay? They're immature. Listen, telling someone not to do something you did is not hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is when you know a truth that could spare someone years of pain and anguish and you keep it to yourself like you don't know it. That's hypocrisy. Not warning them. That's not hypocrisy. You know, when, see, when you talk to kids about those things you did, and you go back and look at the scripture and it talks about telling them about the things that we did. You talk about those things with honesty. You talk about those things with humility. You don't brag about them. You talk about the consequences you suffered. You talk about how glad you are God has brought you out of those things. And you call those kids of yours to be smarter than you were. If you'll do that, you'll build credibility with your kids like you cannot imagine. All right, now we're going to come back to that again in a minute, but let's go to B, the next one. I need to honestly evaluate our current position as a family, okay? Now, this may be really painful for us, especially if we think we've already failed our kids. You know, if you've got kids that are grown up and moved out on their own, you may think you failed them. This may be a painful one, but we're going to, kind of these three points here are kind of all wound together. At camp, when we uh, take these kids out to orient themselves, and to find their destination, um, we require them to look at the landscape and find at least three landmarks that they can see visually with their eyes that they can also locate on the map. And when they do that, that lets them triangulate themselves. They can figure out where they are. And sometimes they find that they're actually too low. We take them down into a valley where all the landmarks are hidden. So they have to go find a higher vantage point to look for the landmarks. Listen. 
The highest point you and I can use to find a landmark for where we are is God's Word. And when we learn Scripture and we start figuring out how it all fits together and we understand our state apart from God, it makes it possible for us to find the landmarks and it makes it possible so that we can avoid or help our kids avoid some of those same stupid things that we did before. But see, as long as we are rebellious, as long as we are making exceptions to God's rule, to God's word, we're not going to be able to orient ourselves correctly. Because we're never going to be high enough to see the landmarks we need, we need to find. You know, so when the kids can't find the landmarks, you know what we have them do? We tell them, first thing you need to do is you need to sit, you need to pray, and you need to take some notes. Write on your map what you can see and study your map for where you are now. Maybe you need to find some lesser landmarks to locate where you are. And you and I, we need to locate spiritually where we are with our families and where each of our family members are so that we know how to get us all onto the right course. And let's go to C. Find the correct starting point. You know, once we figure out where we are, we can locate the place we got to start from. But we've got to figure out where we are, and then we've got to move there formally so we can begin. Now, this is where that pain we talked about in, in point B there is if we think we've already failed our kids. What we do with these kids when we're, we're teaching them the orientation stuff is we actually, we take them down the valleys, or we take them down into like, uh, I, I love Illinois because this is so perfect. Illinois is perfect for this. It is so full of blackberries and raspberries and things with thorns, plants that bite, you know? And so we take them down into one of those kind of briar patches or bramble patches, and we start them from there. Or we take them and we start them in a place where the edges are too steep for them to climb out without help, where they've got to work as a team to get out. Or uh, we take them out before light and we set them along a fence somewhere so we don't lose them. <laughs> set them along a fence and we leave them there in the dark and they can't move until it's light. And they wonder, what am I supposed to do here in the dark? And we say, sit and pray there are no wolves. Guess who takes them out in the dark? I love it. Um, but, uh, you know, what we do is we, we tell them, you know what, you're just going to have to sit there and sit in the dark, and you're going to pray until the light begins to come. And when the light begins to come, then you can begin to move. Listen, you and I have got some painful things we've got to overcome. And some of, the some of the time here when we figure out where our current position is, we're going to find that our family is sitting alone in the dark in the patch of brambles. And it's tough. And sometimes all we can do is sit and pray and wait for the light to begin to come. And then we begin the journey out. Even though emotionally we're going to get scraped up, we're going to get punctured, we're going to get bruised. But understand this. You have to move or you die. You have to complete the journey. Now, what's the correct starting point? Deuteronomy 6. You must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. In other words, listen, one of the things that just makes me nauseate is when I hear, I hear people from here say this. I know what the Bible says about that, but I disagree. <laughs> and what really makes me nauseated is when kids are sitting next to their parents and they say that in front of their parents and their parents are like, mm, yeah, leave them down there in the fence in the dark with the wolves. Listen, we've got to help them. You've got to commit yourself wholeheartedly. Not, I'm going to give all of my heart, except, ah, God's just going to have to deal with the fact I disagree with him on this thing. Number seven, repeat these truths again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road and when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands. Wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorpost of your house. He says, look, you commit as a family. Put scripture around your house. Write it on the bathroom mirror. Hang up plaques. Pray together. You know, make it known to your family that you are starting on a spiritual journey for serious now. And we're in the dark, but we're going to start with prayer. We're going to pray together. We're going to talk about this daily as we move to where God wants us to be. And if nobody else in your family will go, you go anyhow. Now, don't, talk to, don't talk them to death about it. All right? Don't, don't pray for them and aim your prayers. Dear God, please help my husband not to be so stupid. That's not a prayer, okay? That's an attack. Live it out and model it. Live it out and model it. All right, question number two. So we got to find we got to find the correct starting point here. Now we're going in. Where are we going? We got to find the destination. And here's the destination. We read this a little bit earlier. Okay, here's King David explaining this. 
For he issued his laws to Jacob, he gave his instructions to Israel, he commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children so the next generation might know them, even the children not yet born, and they will in turn teach their children so each generation should set its hope anew on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands. Then they will not be like their ancestors, stubborn, rebellious, and faithful, refusing to give their hearts to God. Now, King David's son Solomon comes along. And Solomon takes over the kingdom. Solomon is given supernatural wisdom, but he decides, well, God and I, yeah, I know what God says, but I just don't agree with him on this. And Solomon ends up destroying the kingdom. So he goes from being the wisest, wealthiest man in the world to a lonely man who dies surrounded by wealth and people scheming how to take it away from him. His own kids go to a civil war against each other. And he's looking back over his whole life. He's tried everything. And here's Ecclesiastes 12. You have to write this in. Somehow I missed this in your notes. Ecclesiastes 12, 13. You can just abbreviate it. ECC. It's the only book by that name even close in the Old Testament. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. He says, here's the whole story. That's it. That was all of it. Now, here now is my final conclusion on my whole life story. Fear God and obey his commands, for this is everyone's duty. He says, if you do that, you've done everything God's called you to do. If you love God and obey his commands. See, as far as our kids are concerned, what we need to deal with on them isn't so much the destination way out in the end. We need to do some short-term goals for them, some short-range goals. We're going to teach them we're heading for wisdom one day at a time. And as we get this wisdom, that helps us get on into our future. So let me tell you what you can do with your kids. You need to write some specific measurable goals for your kids. You need to do this from early on. Write some specific measurable goals. But make a list for your kids that before they go to bed, they have to clean up their room. Or they have to do their homework when they come home from school before they can go outside and play, you know. Uh, but, but you need to give them even a simple list of chores that they can do. Maybe it's once a week, maybe it's once a day. But they've got to be able to have something they can go and checklist because you are teaching them self-discipline. And without self-control, they will not succeed at anything in the world. And as they do that, you can award other privileges. But let me tell you, that checklist should include these two things. Some spiritual training. You need to say prayer time. That ought to be on their list for every day. They need to go in and spend some time praying. You say, well, my kid's not old enough to pray. Listen, if your kid's old enough to push back on you and have a conversation, they're old enough to pray. You can write Bible study on that list. Get them a kid's Bible study. Get them a, 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 through the year in a Bible for kids. I mean, you can find all kinds of stuff at Sam's. You can find it at Family Bookstore. Okay, find them something to get them into God's word. One of the simplest things you can do is just say, hey, we're going to read through the book of Proverbs, the whole family. Each chapter takes about 10 minutes to read. So you've got to read that. And like you read whatever day, whatever chapter of the day of the month is today. What is today? 19th. Okay, so today's the 19th. So you say, okay, so today we're all going to read chapter 19. Tomorrow we're going to read chapter 20. And if you skip a day, you still go on with your schedule. Don't go back and make it up. But if you'll do that, at the end of the year, your kids will have read, they will have read through God's book of wisdom 12 times. Think that will catch on at any point? Yeah, some of it will. All right. Question number three. How will I get there? Now, you notice I worded this one different. The others are, are where we are, how, you know, us. This one is singular because somebody's got to do it. And I worded this one differently because I get tired of people saying, well, I would do that, but my husband won't do it. You know what a husband's saying? Well, I'd do it, but my wife won't do it. Yeah, come on. You know, you lead the way. You, you get into a Bible study. You get into an accountability group. You get into a parenting class. You get into personal counseling. Whatever it is that's needed, you do it even if they won't do it. All right, conclusion. I got a to-do list for you. All right, to-do list. Here we go. First one, A, pray over my children. Now, I'm very specific in that use of the word over. We need to pray with our kids because they need to see it modeled, right? And I'm serious. As soon as your kids are old enough to have a conversation, they're old enough to get rid of the God is great, God is good, let us thank him for our food. (laughs) Amen, all right? You can get them off the rhymes and get them into conversational prayer with God as soon as they can have conversations. So you need to model that for them so you pray in front of your kids. If your kid's the only one praying over meals at your house, you are falling down, okay, in leadership. You pray. And we need to pray for our kids on a daily basis. But I think there's great power in praying over our kids as well. Here's what I mean by that. My kids, they've been growing up. At nighttime, I sleep weird hours. Yeah, I sleep like three hours, four hours, and I'm up for an hour, and then maybe I go back to bed for three or four hours or a couple hours. Maybe I don't, but I'm up in the middle of the night a lot. I don't know why. I've just always done that. 
And uh, so I get up in the middle of the night, and what I'll do is I'll go down, and I'll stand over my kid's bed while they're sleeping, and I'll pray for them. And I'll plead with God to protect them. I'll plead with God to grow them strong. I'll plead with God to help them make the right choices. And I've done that almost every night that we've had kids. Almost every night that we've had kids. Now, I didn't do it to the married ones. That'd be just kind of creepy. Um, <laughs> so I pray for them from a distance. All right? All right? <laughs> B, next one. Be willing to say no to some good things to say yes to the best things. Not everything your kids want to do is bad for them, but not everything your kids want to do is good for them. So there might even be some really good things they want to do, but here's the test. You as a parent have got to ask. Here's the test. Will this thing that my child wants to do, whether it's sports or club or band or whatever, will this help my child to love the Lord their God with all their heart, all their soul, all their mind, all their strength? Or will this block them from doing that? That's the test. That's the test. Next one, C. Look for opportunities to bring God into our conversations. Look for opportunities to bring God into our conversations. We've talked this, about this already, but when should we bring Him in the conversation? He says, repeat them again and again and again. When you're standing up, when you're sitting down, when you're traveling, before you go to bed at night, make God a normal part of your conversation. Ask your kids, so did you spend any time with God today? What did you talk with God about today? Now, at some point, they'll tell you, I don't want to tell you what I talked to God about. And that's okay, because they're talking to Him, right? So ask them, but you're going to train them. Next thing, D, talk with my kids about my walk with God. You know, I've, 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 I've spoken with my kids on several occasions, uh, kind of regular in some ways, uh, about my walk with God and say, ah, God and I are a little frustrated with each other today. God's teaching me something I really don't want to learn today. <laughs> you know, but we have those conversations and they learn the process and how that works too. So you show them what, show them what a spiritual life looks like, warts and all. Now, don't show them anything that will damage them. You know, be age appropriate, but work with them. All right. And E, last thing, is have my kids involved in church. Have my kids involved in church. Now, I had an epiphany this week. I like to take things and make them so that they're really easy to understand, so that just anybody can get them. Um, so, how many hours do we have in a week? 168 hours in a week. All right, 168 hours in a week. That seems like a lot of time, and sometimes church seems like a lot of time too, right? So i got a visual illustration for you. You see that yellow rope hanging in here? Starts down at this wall on this end, in venue one. Goes all the way down over the welcome center down to that window, and then it turns and it comes almost back all the way to this beam. That's 168 feet of rope. That's one foot per hour in a week. All right, that's a little more than half a football field. Now, let me give you something so you can compare some things. Dave, would you be my lovely assistant? I'll give you the part with the pink on it. Okay, there you go. Hold on, hold, slow down. Whoa, whoa, much, 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 much. Okay. All right, keep going, keep going. Find your way back there. Find your way back there. Just tell Jason to move. It won't hurt him. Okay, that's good. There you go. There you go. All right. One foot per hour. You know what this represents? This is your kids in school being taught by somebody else. This is their time in school being taught stuff in the bathroom by their friends and on the playground. This is the amount of time your kids are spending learning from not you. All right, okay, come back this way. Slowly, please. Don't spill anything there. Don't knock all the Colson stuff over. Okay. Now, with that as a frame of reference, thanks, you're okay. I don't care what Marty says about you. All right. Now, this right here, I used this one yesterday for the guys. This represents the amount of time that a man spends on Facebook in a week. Now, see that other one? That represents his wife. does my house okay so now remember how long your kids spend out 
being taught by other people? If the only spiritual training you're offering your kids is church at adventure, that's how much spiritual training your kids are getting compared to that really long one or compared to the 168. So suddenly church isn't that big of a deal, is it? When you start seeing it in perspective. Now, let me give one for you. Your spiritual training, if the only spiritual training you're getting is when I'm sitting in the chair up here, that's how much of your week is spent in spiritual training. See the challenge? We've got to be getting training at other times. Not just for ourselves, but for our kids. The goal is that they love the Lord their God with all their heart, all their soul, all their mind, and all their strength. If you, succeed, if you can succeed at directing them in that path, you're completing your role as a parent. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father, thank you so much for your love. And Father, it's kind of weird to see our week laid out in feet. And then to realize just how few inches we give towards spiritual training when the week is measured in feet. More than half a football field's worth. Father, help us to, to get a good idea of where we really are in our spiritual walk and where our family really is, where each member of our family is in the spiritual journey. Father, help us find that correct starting point. And Father, help us to find the destination and use your word as the map to figure out how to get there. Father, may we learn to talk to our kids about you when we sit, when we stand, when we're traveling in the car, when we're sitting at a stop sign, when we're, we're preparing the kids for bed at night. And Father, may we lift them in prayer. May we undergird them in prayer. And Father, may we pray over them as well that they will love you. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.